Uh, welcome uh, to our uh, panel on the impact of Me Too on, on Wall Street and corporate America. Um, five years since Me Too, the Me Too hashtag came into the mainstream and started a movement, uh, how much has changed? It's certainly been talked about for the last five years. Uh, even as we speak, we didn't know when we planned this event that uh, Eugene Carroll's trial against a certain well-known public persona would be taking place. Uh, you hear about sexual harassment cases all the time, every day. Uh, so a lot of toxic work environments have been exposed, but now what happens? And are there things that we as financial uh, writers can do to uh, show a way forward uh, and to look more at how the workplace can be made less, less toxic? Uh, and what's being done that, that uh, works. Uh, well, we have three heavy hitters here tonight to uh, shed some light on those questions and other questions. Uh, on my immediate right is Maria Aspen, who's a senior writer at Fortune. Maria uh, writes features primarily about gender, finance, health, and the intersection of business and government policy, um, including uh, uh, having covered a number of sexual harassment cases. And in fact, just yesterday, she broke a story about a big case on Wall Street in which Sarah Tershwell uh, had been suing her former employer, TCW Group. That was supposed to go to trial next week, and it was settled out of court just, just before. Uh, next is Julie Roginski. Uh, Julie is a, po a political activist, an advocate for women's rights, and an advisor to business and government leaders. She's a former contributor to CNN, or CNBC sorry, and uh, the Fox News Channel. And in 2017, she was one of the first women to step forward suing Fox News for sexual harassment and retaliation, Fox News and Roger Ailes. She co-founded with Gretchen Carlson, uh, Lift Our Voices, which is a nonprofit that seeks to create a safer and more equitable workplace for all. And on uh, Julie's right is Sylvia Ann Hewlett, an economist, entrepreneur, and acclaimed author. Sylvia is the CEO of Hewlett Consulting Partners and a founder of CoQual, a global uh, nonprofit think tank that addresses bias and uncovers barriers to advancement for underrepresented people in the workplace. And she's the author of 18 books, including uh, Me Too in the Corporate World, Power, Privilege, and the Path Forward. So welcome our distinguished panelists. And uh, since this is in the news, I'd like to start by asking Maria a bit more about the implications of this out-of-court settlement. In the article that came out yesterday in Fortune, you said that uh, this suit, if it had gone to court, could have kicked off a new round of reckoning. So what are the implications of it being settled out of court, a kind of quiet settlement? Uh, we have another prominent Wall Street case coming up soon, and that might be settled out of court. And uh, so what does this mean for the general uh, you know, awareness, public awareness of what actually goes on in, in Wall Street? Jan, uh, how's that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, well, first of all, Jan, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, and thank you all for having me. It's really an honor to be on this panel. Um, the story I wrote yesterday, for those of you who haven't been following this in, in the same granularity that I have, there are two tr there are two long pending lawsuits against uh, big financial firms that have to do with sexual harassment and gender bias. One of them is an individual lawsuit, or was an individual lawsuit. Uh, an investor named Sarah Tershwell was suing uh, her former employer, TCW Group. Uh, the, starting, she sued in early 2018, claiming that she had been sexually harassed by her supervisor, and then fired for reporting it. Uh, that case was supposed to go to trial starting Monday, and it, uh, it settled right before. Um, Meanwhile, there's a much bigger lawsuit, a class action alleging gender bias at Goldman. That's been in the headlines a lot. Uh, there are 1,400 plaintiffs. Um, that case dates all the way back to the lead plaintiff um, first complaint to the EEOC in 2005. 
and then uh, turned that into a lawsuit in 2010. That case is supposed to go to trial next month, and just this afternoon, the Journal and Bloomberg broke that Goldman is uh, trying to settle that for $200 million, which we were discussing a little bit before, um, is not that much money. When For a little bit of context, uh, the, the Smith Barney Boom Boom Room lawsuit, uh, which was kind of a landmark uh, gender or landmark sexual harassment case against Wall Street, settled for 150 million, and that was in the 90s. So, um, what are the implications? I mean, I wasn't shocked that the Tershwell suit settled. It had been going on for five years, and it was it was notable largely just because such cases usually don't even make it to the lawsuit stages because of mandatory arbitration clauses and. Um, you know, when I talked to Sarah Tershwell in, in the fall, she mentioned that during a 30-year career on Wall Street, uh, TCW was the only place that had not required her to sign a mandatory arbitration clause as part of her employment agreement, so she was free to pursue this case. Um, we usually don't see it with this. Julie can speak in much more depth than I can. Um, but it was an individual case. It was a he said, she said case. You know, uh, there's... There had been some coverage of Tershwell, and she had kind of been raked over the coals. Um, and it, it was a messy case. She had, before filing suit, she had previously dated her supervisor. So there, there wasn't sort of this overwhelming, like, yes, this is the clear, um, this is the clear person in the right, this is the clear institution in the wrong that you that you may want in these cases. But it was. It was notable that she had like stuck with it for five years, and I wasn't terribly surprised, but I was a little bit surprised that she did settle right before it went to trial. I would say something else about Wall Street. Uh, Sylvia's book, uh, Me Too in the Corporate World, uh, uh, spun off partially from a uh, survey of uh, incidences of sexual misconduct in the workplace. Uh, by various categories, and one of the categories was by industry. Uh, Wall Street actually came in a few rungs below uh, the two top offending industries, which were media. Mm -hmm. Do I hear? Uh, <laughs> do I hear a collective uh, <laughs> gasp of surprise? Uh, and technology, which is probably also no surprise. Um, but nevertheless, Wall Street uh, has, obviously has some major uh, prominent uh, incidences of, of offensive behavior. Um, Julie, we had talked and you had said that it's it really is quite a difficult industry in terms of t uh, toxic workplaces and sexual misconduct. Uh, could you talk a bit about that and some of what you've seen? Sure. Um, well, I think partially, much like any other industry, Wall Street has a tendency of being very insular. And so that if you have an incident at Goldman Sachs, people will find out about it regardless of where you go, and, and not just with respect to Wall Street, but I think with respect to media or technology or government or any other contained industry, the reality is that a lot of women are afraid to come forward because they're, they'll be tapped, right? Um, the good news about forced arbitration that you mentioned is all of you will be covering these stories in a lot more depth in the future because um, we work very hard to eradicate forced arbitration specifically for sexual harassment and assault. So the good news is <laughs> I guess if there's good news in this case, um, these stories will not be covered up anymore through um, forced arbitration the way they have been consistently. And, and I will say, we as an organization um, asked Goldman Sachs a few years ago, one of their shareholder meetings, to at least study the effects that forced arbitration was having on their um, employees and on their culture. And Goldman Sachs, of course, the leadership said, there's no issue here. We don't have to do this at all. I'm very happy to say that the shareholders actually voted against Goldman Sachs' position and, and forced Goldman Sachs to study the issue. But what's fascinating is, is at the same time that Goldman Sachs was telling us that there was no issue, and I don't mean to pick on Goldman Sachs because you can probably find this to any other bank. Um, at the same time that Goldman Sachs was telling us this, um, we were hearing from women all over Goldman Sachs. I mean, from, from the top rungs, to receptionists who were saying, we're going through hell, but we can't say anything. And the reason we can't say anything is twofold. One, we're in arbitration, and that's a secret chamber where people are just not allowed to talk about what's going on, which is exactly how it's designed to be. 
Um, the other issue is, of course, the, the fear of retaliation, which I think is, which I think is so powerful. And, and as journalists, what to me is always fascinating about some of these stories is you hear these very explosive stories about a woman coming forward at a bank or a media or anywhere else and, and saying, this happened to me, me too, raising her hand, which takes, I have to say, having gone through it with Roger Ailes myself, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not easy, obviously, um, to be that person. You don't want to be known as the person who's been sexually harassed, right? Because it's just a, hopefully a small sliver of your life and you want to be known for the things you've done at work, not necessarily bad. But after you come forward and the media, there's a media swarm, and I'm sure there, will, there was for Sarah, and I'm sure there will be for, for some of the more leading claims we've seen in Goldman Sachs' case. What ends up happening is after the media goes away and moves on to something else, that's really where the retaliation begins. And so I would say that when that happens, the cycle perpetuates itself. And so my plea to all of you is, as men and women who cover this industry, is stay on the story. And just because somebody came forward and raised her hand and said, the, the chairman of this bank or, or some senior partner, somebody harassed me or assaulted me, um, and, and you guys all go crazy and write the story, but then you move on, stay on it, check back in with her in a year to see what happened to her afterwards, because I bet you 99% of the time, she can't find a job in the industry again. She's been a marked woman. And that's the sad reality of what happens in a lot of these cases. And that's why so many women, even if they have unimpeachable evidence, don't want to talk to you, don't want to put their names to this, right? Don't want to go on the record specifically because of that. Um, they don't want to be tagged as the woman who complains, um, the troublemaker, the woman who can't roll with the guys in a culture that's very dominated by after hours socializing, right? A lot of these deals get done Sometimes they get done at strip clubs, sometimes they get done at bars, I mean, there's just you. Um, so I think that's, to, to, this is a very long answer to your question, that's really what has changed and what hasn't changed in this environment, despite being able to say me too, maybe being believed in a way that you weren't believed five or 10 years ago, a lot of women still are reluctant to come forward specifically because of the retaliatory aspect of what happened. One more, yeah, just one more question to follow up on that, sure. and then I pass the question for Sylvia. But uh, I'm not sure everyone is familiar with the act that did away with non-disclosure agreements yep. and forced arbitration. Um, it's called the Speak Out Act, and I wonder if you could talk, you know, talk a bit about that and the work you did yeah. to get that passed. Thank you. So good. Um, and, and also, can the Speak Out Act itself lead to more retaliation? Because there will be more public cases. Um, so there's two bills. The Speak Out Act is the second. The arbitration one is called, <laughs> it's a very creative name, the Ending Forced Arbitration for Sexual Harassment and Sexual Assault Act, <laughs> um, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, the, the genesis of this is that my, my partner, Lift Her Voices, Gretchen Carlson, who I don't think many of you may be familiar with, but was the first woman um, to come forward about Roger Ailes at Fox News. And, and when she first approached her lawyers, um, who are also my lawyers, to, to talk about this, they said to her, I'm sorry, you can't, you don't have a case. And she said, hypothetically, I have all this evidence. Um, and they said, it doesn't matter what evidence you have because you are bound by an arbitration clause that's in your contract. Um, and she always says that was a very dark day for her because it basically precluded her from coming forward. Luckily, our lawyers had a very novel idea, which was to sue Roger Ailes in a personal capacity, which is the only reason any of you or any of us really know this story and arguably really kind of kicked off this new iteration of the Me Too movement was about a year before the Weinstein revelations. And so when that happened and then my case happened, we got together and said, this can't happen to anybody else. I They forgot to put an arbitration clause in my contract, which is the only reason anybody knows about my senior Roger Ailes. But we are both bound by NDA, so we can't talk much about our cases. What we did was we started working, um, she, she started working even before I could, because I was still at Fox, um, on the Hill to um, eradicate forced arbitration for, for all toxic environments. And uh, we were able to get it done for sexual harassment and assault. We wanted to get it done for race and gender and everything else, but you need 10 Republicans to overcome the filibuster. And, our friends on the Republican side of the aisle didn't want to go that far, but we were able to do it for sexual harassment and sexual assault, which means, um, again, that if you are able to, uh, if you now 
want to sue for being harassed or assaulted, um, you can do it, which means that you all will find out about it because it's going to be a public lawsuit. The NDA um, bill was called the Speak Out Act, and that we got done in December of last year. The president signed it into law in December. And that also bans pre-dispute NDAs for sexual harassment and assault. So that means if you have not yet filed a lawsuit or taken any legal action to sue somebody for sexual harassment and assault, you can speak out about it, which means that you can call a reporter. So if somebody's harassing you as we speak, um, before you go to HR, before you call a lawyer, you can call a reporter and tell them about it. But yes, I mean, the answer to your question is, of course, just because you can doesn't mean you will. Um, because it's no fun being that person, as I mentioned earlier. And um, there is a lot of fear of, of retaliation. And we always say changing laws, even in this very, very, very hyper partisan environment is easy <laughs> compared to changing culture. And it will only be when people no longer are worried about retaliation um, that I think we'll be able to really see sea change where people will come forward in ways that they, that they aren't right now. Thank you. And uh, so many questions to ask, <laughs> um, and so little time. And I have a question for Sylvia about the reason that corporations care about sexual harassment suits to begin with. Um, you've talked a lot about how there are hits to the bottom line when a company, uh, if, when it's known that a company ha has a record of sexual misconduct. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. What are those hits to the bottom line? And why, you know, why do companies care? Well, Jan, that's a great question. Um, let me just put out there first um, the three new findings uh, of my book, which came out in 2020. And it was based on all kinds of new data that uh, I uh, assembled, uh, lots of surveys that I did uh, in late uh, 2019. So it was pre-pandemic, pre and that's an important thing to realize. The three pieces of uh, new news was that um, I was able to distinguish between sexual harassment and sexual assault. So 34% of uh, women uh, in white collar jobs uh, have experienced sexual harassment, but 9% have experienced sexual assault. Um, and that's very important post-pandemic because we find that harassment is going up but assault went down in the pandemic because actually that's an in-person sport or whatever people see it as. I had it described that way by uh, a man I interviewed. Uh, so, so there are often divergent trends and obviously one is much more serious than the other. The other brand new findings was that in addition to the usual suspects, which are the majority, you know, younger, talented women in the professional workplace, there are three other targets. One, black men. 23% of black men in managerial and executive positions experience sexual harassment. They do not report. It's profoundly humiliating. Uh, oftentimes it's a junior person who uh, molest them, for instance. And this is something that they are not prepared to uh, report. The other group is gay women. 43% of um, lesbian women, as opposed to 34% of straight women, are sexually harassed. Again, it's a very complicated story with a bunch of humiliation which deepens uh, the already fierce sense of otherness that these people have. Uh, I found those findings are fascinating because it showed the degree to which it was uh, sexual misconduct is oftentimes about power. Keeping the outsiders off your territory, right? Humiliating, diminishing them. It's not so much about desire. Uh, and all kinds of interviews I did, lots of voices, real voices, you know, uh, underscore that. Uh, and I guess the other thing which Jan has already mentioned, uh, in the tech world, 42% of women are harassed or assaulted, which is twice 
her weight on the list twice. Which explains why 60% of women who quit Silicon Valley do it because of the toxic sexual uh, harassment that is, is going on. Which you know explains <laughs> why it's such a bro culture. Uh, and that's certainly ongoing. To respond directly to Jan, obviously when you're draining your talent pipeline of some of your most able STEM women, right? That is a serious blow to the bottom line because overall we've had shortages of this kind of skill set. But the two most obvious hits are one, you know, lawsuits. Um, the Boy Scouts were wiped out by over a billion dollars of claims. Uh, the Catholic Church is only half its former size, right? And Michigan State uh, has al also suffered a over one billion dollar, you know, set of claims. And you know, we can talk about Google is now up to four hundred and fifty million. You know, there's lots of examples out there. So obviously, it's a deterrent, kind of. But you know, it's amazing um, how men seem to be willing, and at least some women, to get cut off the knees at the knees because they seemingly can't control their behavior. I mean, it is quite amazing. The one I would choose to dwell on is actually the brand problem right now. I interviewed the um, chief risk officer of City uh, recently, uh, someone called Bradford Hugh. And he says that he got the um, sexual misconduct portfolio because it was the most um, real risk to the city brand. It's not often HR anymore, right? <laughs> because, you know, it can knock 15 billion off the company's brand in a nanosecond if the wrong pictures get, you know, ricocheted around the world. So I, I think that at least um, a whole bunch of substantive, you know, kind of progressive companies are now prepared to draw a line. Think of McDonald's. Steve Easterbrook had, was gone at twice. Uh, there were some complaints some five years ago. He was a very successful CEO. He turned the company around. He done some extraordinary things to resurrect you know, Do uh, McDonald's as a very high earnings company. But then it turned out that there were a bunch of complaints uh, uh, on the sexual misconduct front with people, with women who uh, were direct reports of this. So there was a friendly settlement. He was yanked out, but he was given $40 million as a kind of golden parachute. But journalists stayed with it, and I, I want to kind of reiterate that. And what they discovered over the long run was that he was in the business of sexting and sharing all kinds of graphic pornography with the company from his company uh, computer, right? So what McDonald's did at that point was not hush it up and do a deal. Uh, they had a clawback, and he had to pay damages of $105 million. So I, I guess it's a very mixed picture out there. People, uh, McDonald's felt they were standing in for, you know, regular Americans, you know, the family next door, that kind of thing. And uh, these values were not theirs. Um, City is much more worried about its, you know, high net worth with the customers and capital flight. But, you know, there is this sense that whether it's brand or hits to the bottom line very directly through law suits, or the degree to which talent flees, which is what Google is talking about right now. That also explains why investors are concerned about sexual misconduct suits um, or about any ex exposure. And uh, if, the, if there are more lawsuits uh, and more public airing of cases, um, 
it might be it might it be something that investors keep an even closer watch on and if, if there, where there's even more investor pressure uh, to do something about a toxic environment if that's a question to anyone who wants to answer it well maybe we get some response from the audience Yes. This is not uh, answering your question, but I, I, I thought so, what Sylvia said about the clawback at McDonald's was very heartening. It's, I would love to see many more contracts that have that clawback provisions in them, where more pay and bonus money and stock options are put into escrow, yeah. so that they can be clawed back mm -hmm. on That's sexual harassment issues, but other issues too, That's right? It. it just I, makes so much sense. Like, you know, if, if um, uh, Carlson had some kind of clawback fund that, you know, he had to pay back some of his multi-million dollar paychecks, you know, um, having tanked the network, um, that might be good. Because it, it was bullying and um, misconduct, at the very least, uh, in that case. If I may. I think the McDonald's example is an interesting one because it was ultimately um, the CEO's personal behavior that, that brought him down and led to these clawbacks. But McDonald's also faced you know, lots of accusations among rank and file workers of sexual harassment or assault in the franchises. And um, I would go farther and say, yes, I'd love to see clawbacks for not just CEO's personal behavior, but for, you know, engendering cultures, workplace cultures, in which this behavior is shown to be rampant. Actually, yeah, I think that's a really important point because the culture really comes from the top down, always. I mean, always, and we see this consistently. If the CEO is behaving a certain way, then people underneath him, typically him, sometimes her, are behaving the same way too. And you, you mentioned Tucker Carlson, but, um, you know, first of all, Roger Ailes, Gretchen Carlson, yes. got a reported large sum of money um, as part of her settlement. Roger Ailes got twice that, right? <laughs> as, as part of as part of his exit package, um, so which was fascinating. But what's also fascinating about it is the culture is not typically relegated to one person. No. And um, there's there's limited things that I could say about Fox News, but I can tell you that no Roger Ailes, no Tucker Carlson, right? Uh, right. In the sense that it, it's 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 a uh, it's not a surprise to me that that kind of stuff continues to go on right. even long after Roger Ailes has not only left the network right. but has died. Um, and I think what you see with somebody like T Tucker Carlson is he does have a morals clause, I suspect, in his contract. We all did um, in our TV contract. But they're interpreted very, very, very sporadically when it benefits the company. So I, I assume a lot of CEOs probably have morals clauses in their contracts where you could claw the money back if you wanted to make the case, the board wanted to make the case that you somehow violated your morals contract. On the other hand, if you're doing that for the CEO, you might have to look further down the line as to who else is making those same kinds of violations of their morals contract. And I think that's a lot of times why boards want to get rid of the top guy, settle, don't want to claw anything back because he could easily, he probably has a lot of evidence that he's not the only one and that's when boards start getting very concerned about the future of their country, a company. So, um, another uh, current issue is the, the remote workplace. Um, you think that in the remote workplace, not much could happen, but uh, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Uh, Julie had mentioned that. And could you talk a bit about sure. what happens? In the remote workplace. Yeah, ironically, maybe not ironically, based on what Sylvia said, but um, harassment, not assault, but harassment has gone up um, since people started working remotely during COVID. And it really went up during COVID. And I, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't really explain the correlation other than maybe people were lonely <laughs> and, felt, and felt more at ease um, about doing things they shouldn't have been doing. Um, a lot of it also is about isolation. And if you're isolating, um, a potential survivor or potential victim, um, then there's nobody to witness your bad behavior. If you're both on Zoom and, and there's no witnesses, nobody can walk past you, nobody can look into a glass walled off office to see something's happening. So ironically enough, um, working from home has actually been less safe 
for workers, um, especially as it comes to sexual harassment. It's certainly not a solved situation for them yet. If I could just expand on that, um, there are two wrinkles. Uh, for instance, you know, um, in the companies I've looked at recently, and I have three clients uh, dealing with this, uh, there is this kind of um, split, right? Uh, harassment has went up in the pandemic, um, and assault is going up in the return to work. work because, you know, assault <laughs> is an in-person thing, and clearly. Uh, but the other thing uh, that happened is perceptions, particularly of black employees. Because um, if you talk to major employers, which I've been doing, um, African-American managers and executives have been choosing remote options, not even hybrid options or back and forth fully, because they perceive that they're safe. Now, actually, that's not borne out by the facts. But it shows the degree to which they're leery of the microaggressions uh, that have always happened at work, you know, on the, in the office. And they've not, maybe they've seen what's happened online as somehow aberrant, but there's a lot of fear uh, about going back to work. And in fact, it, it's a very problematic thing because um, you know there's no, uh, now a lot of evidence that shows that people who opt for fully remote arrangements uh, get stuck. They're on a slow road to nowhere because they don't find sponsors, they don't find new clients. You know, they're not pulled into meetings on a spontaneous basis, and so they're they're plateaued. And um, uh, Catherine Mann, who's on the bank of the uh, on the on the board of the Bank of England, said, "You know, what's emerging is a virtual track and um, a uh, in-person track, and it's the new mommy track because it tends to be women, particularly women of color. So I'm just saying that this is a, a field of research which we don't." Um, uh, really totally understand yet, but there's cross-cutting evidence, that the partial evidence that is out there. And, and what we do know is that um, African-American uh, people of color who are in uh, the pipeline are not progressing as they did in the late teens, and women's progression has slowed down. Because women as a group, um, either took longer breaks over COVID, or they opted for more fully remote arrangements when COVID broke. And just to sort of go in the other direction, I, I, think, I think these are really important points. And I also think, you know, when we think of Me Too, or when we think of the issues faced by women, women of color, people of color in the workplace, it's a continuum, right? Like misconduct, um, being you know assaulted is one thing, harassment is another thing. There are also just the the cultures of systemic bias and discrimination, yeah, the microaggressions, microaggressions, but also just systemic um, pay inequity, for yeah. example, lack of promotion opportunities. Um, the Goldman lawsuit, the class action, is interesting because. Although it started, although the lead plaintiff, you know, uh, experienced an assault by a coworker um, over the 17 years that she pursued the case, and it, it went through legal motions, it's now a gender discrimination case. It's not a harassment case, but it all kind of yeah. plays together. And I'm, I think this, uh, the impact of remote work in the pandemic, and, and how that has affected different classes of people, will will continue to have long term effects. On just systemic inequities. That's so true. Very interesting and disturbing, and um, the, and it drives home the point that sexual misconduct isn't just a, a, a gender issue. I mean, it's a it's about power. Really, it's about who has the power. Uh, and in fact, there have been in some instances of uh, women sexually harassing men, women sexually harassing women. Um, 
people, as Sylvia says, people of color being sexually harassed a lot is a power play. Um, this also brings up uh, something that has been talked about a lot since the Me Too movement um, gained steam in the mainstream, and that's how men uh, in the workplace respond to the uh, idea that there are so many things that uh, might be offensive, uh, so many things you can say, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, that question comes up every time pretty much it, you talk about sexual misconduct in the workplace, uh, that men fear that any mis misinterpreted statement um, will get them fired or any minor transgression will get them fired. Um, there are some, uh, there are various gradations of what you can do to make, to uh, stop uh, problematic behavior besides just axing anyone who does, um, who commits a, a transgression. Uh, and I know that, and, and Sylvia's book talks about that a lot, so this is a question for Sylvia, but this is also a question um, uh, uh, for Maria and for Julie, if you'd like to talk about it. What are the alternatives to just saying, you know, one strike and you're out? Uh, I'll be real quick because um, it's all laid out in this book, right? But yeah. uh, I, I did some amazing work with Diane Gerson at IBM uh, for my book. And she found two things were really working. First off, turning bystanders into upstanders, giving every team leader um, almost a playbook in terms of how to be an activist, an upstander, and head on, right? A whole lot of bad behavior. Secondly, they made a big distinction between harassment and assault. And there wasn't a zero tolerance policy for harassment. You had a road to redemption. And the men loved that. What they were uh, really appalled at uh, was, you know, throwing everyone into the same bucket and just you're out the window, no matter how slight the offense or how gross the offense. And the road to redemption involved the uh, offending person, A, to have been guilty of, or proven guilty of some minor offense, but also being prepared to put the bill for the um, uh, the trainings <laughs> that he or she would then have to go through. It worked very well. The second thing I guess I'd like to stress is that the idea that, um, you know, one size does not fit all is fundamental because no one has found it fair that um, you know uh, a minor transgression is treated the same as you know say a uh, Harvey Weinstein case. Um, and you know right now this is going on at the CBI in London. The CBI um, is the Confederation of British Industry. It's the um, not just the biggest business organization in Britain, but it's the behavior watchdog. Uh, it's supposed to be the exemplar of behavior. Enormously influential. Well, Tony Duncan was thrown out last week because it turned out that on returning <laughs> from the pandemic, he gave a whole lot of really gross parties. <laughs> uh, it's not clear who, who else will you know, get thrown out. But I think what it shows that in this investigation already, uh, men in the old boys club are running in all kinds of different directions because they do not trust the system to either investigate fully or make the distinction, right? Between different types of bad behavior and to, I mean, I think it's so important to link some notion of um, making the punishment fit the crime. Uh, and then I think we get many more men you know, in agreement in terms of the steps that we should take. So I, I do have to just ask, I guess, ask a question and make a comment, which is who does the investigation? 
because and outside. It has to be outside. But, but who pays the outside investigator? Yes. And here's the problem. The problem is HR is not anybody's friend. Anybody who goes to HR expecting justice Agreed. for themselves right, understands that Agreed. HR is there to protect the company. If the company hires an outside investigator, whether an outside law firm or somebody, the law firm is not stupid. You know, they know who's paying their bills. Right, you're right. And therefore, they will come to whatever conclusion they think their client wants them to come. And so the dilemma has always been, and we struggle with this as an organization all the time, how do you actually arrive at the truth? and a truth that is believed by both the accuser and the accused, right? Um, because most of the time, the investigation, quote unquote, is either predetermined and baked in already, or as troublingly for what ends up happening, it's also not believed because people think that even if you have an outside investigator, somebody who's the fix is in from, from the beginning because of who pays the bills. So that's the difficulty of saying you talked about IBM, but I'm wondering who decided that IBM handled this well? Did IBM decide well, that? Well, no, no, no. I, I'm actually making it. Yeah. I, I think you're totally right. But it's the very rare company that even puts it on record that they're interested, right, in a road for redemption for folks who have minor offenses. They don't even say that. I mean, the number of CEOs who just talk about zero tolerance and they throw everyone in the same bucket. That is incredibly alienating for your average executive um, who is male, or even the women who are in power. Uh, and you see, what it prevents, what I find in my data, because I've done a lot of work on sponsorship, is that 64% of senior na men now say they will never sponsor a woman. That is a very, very dire figure, because sponsoring is advocating for their profession not just you know, messing around with mentoring, but actually using up some reputational capital on behalf of this younger woman. They won't do it because they feel that even the appearance of impropriety will have them you know, flung into this bucket of um, zero tolerance for them. That figure has gone up enormously over the last 10 years. And that is one reason why women's progression has stalled. So even the statement of that principle that we're willing to differentiate between different offenses and examine cases, you know, in terms of the seriousness of the offense, which IBM did, is rare. I'm just, I'm thinking a little bit about the tech industry, um, which, Sylvia, I think you brought up. Um, in, in the fall, it was the five-year anniversary of Me Too going viral, um, the Weinstein story coming out in the Times, and my colleagues and I did a retrospective oral history, spoke with a lot of the women who had been involved in the movement before yeah. and after that. And I spoke with Ellen Powell, um, whose lawsuit against Kleiner Perkins predated uh, Weinstein by about five years. And she made this point, first of all, she said, you know, it's a mixed legacy, she's glad she came forward, she's glad she went through the lawsuit, but even now she sees people in the tech industry, men, who kind of dig in their heels in reaction to Me Too is her, her language. Like, you can't tell me what to do, and in fact, I am going to, you know, I am going to invest in this disgraced founder, like kind of, this is a me standing up against cancel culture, or however you want to phrase it. Um, I thought that was interesting and certainly captured um, some sentiment that I've reported on. I just wonder what the alternative is. You know, is it better to not discuss these issues at all? I would, I would argue that it's not better. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's some backlash, and uh, sometimes I, I always wonder if, if those who are the watchdogs, uh, including investors, including women who come forward, you know, will can eventually get burned out on, on a whole subject. Uh, I don't know what you do about that. If anyone has a solution, <laughs> uh, feel free to tell us. But, uh, you know, I guess as somebody who did come forward, yes. I mean, yes, you don't want, well, there's one of two ways to look at it, right? Um, at first, you think you don't want this to identify, to, to become your legacy, this is not all that you're about, and, and you have a whole career, and 
and then you you know in my case i kind of just leaned into it and said well you know since we're in this movement and there are things we could do to change it i guess we'll, we'll be the ones to change it because nobody else is doing it but it is very disheartening to hear i don't know what ellen powell is doing now but i don't know if you know who Fomo zama is um Fomo Zama sued Pinterest for uh, racial discrimination and got a law in California passed that called the Silence No More Act, which eradicated NDAs for all toxic workplace issues in California. She's very open, I'm not talking about speaking out of school because she says this publicly, about the fact that she could not get a job in tech. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a very high up woman, I think one of her senior certainly women, and certainly one of the senior people of color at Pinterest. That's it, I mean, she's a, she's a marked woman. Um, and you hear this over and over and over again, you hear this from people who led the Google lockout. Um, yeah. They're not working anymore. Um, the leader of the Google lockout, I can't believe she's in law school. She's not even um, involved in tech anymore. So none of the women at Fox News who spoke up about Roger Ailes are working in television anymore not even Gretchen. Uh, so what does that tell you about the future, uh, the career trajectory of women who come forward? And so I think that's why I keep pleading with reporters to really stay on the story much longer than the initial explosive allegations. Um, I understand there are a lot of stories to cover, but the real story is not the allegation. The real story is what becomes of both the accuser and the accused afterwards and what you find is the accused either loses his job and then resurfaces again um, a few years later or um, does a mea culpa and, and, and stays where he is and the accuser is the one that has to leave the survivor is the one that has to go elsewhere and i think that's something that's that's incredibly disheartening and i think when women specifically see that i mean in my case i, I was fortunate i was able to speak up because of other life circumstances but i had women coming up to me prominent women who some of you might have seen on TV saying, we wish we could say something, but we are the sole providers for our families yeah. and we cannot say a word. This is our livelihood. Devastating, mm -hmm. devastating, devastating for them, devastating for those of you who cover um, these stories. And I think that's something um, to really bear in mind as to, as to what happens. I, I don't have a good answer to Unfortunately, yeah, but it's, it's an it will. Uh, it's an honest maybe. answer. It's not a good. It's not a good. It's not a happy answer. But yes, I think we should open the floor up to those who cover the subject and have uh, about ten minutes of audience Q and A. Uh, yes, please. Mike, there's a list behind you. I, I just want to take up those pages. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, well, first of all, Sylvia, I think one of the things the IBM did differently was have a, a female CEO at the time, uh, in uh, Ginny or Mitty. Uh, yes, I make that point in my book, so we'll see what happens now. <laughs> okay, but, but to, to get to my question, um, I think to, to your credit, you the, the panel here has established uh, four different categories of, uh, of, of bad behavior. And we've got the sexual assault and the uh, sex discrimination. I think those are pretty well defined. Correct me if I, I'm wrong, but um, the uh, sexual assault, that, that involves actual physical contact. Um, uh, sex discrimination is something that has predated the Me Too movement. You, you know, we've been studying that forever. Uh, but then you also talk about uh, sexual misconduct, which I don't know if, if that's like the the entry level gateway to uh, to the discussion, or if that's a broad term to define it all. And then there's the term sexual harassment which you've been throwing around a lot, and I'm sure you all know what you mean by it, but is there a formal definition? Well, when I collected friend? my data, I, I made a formal definition. Sexual misconduct is the umbrella, right? right. And the two categories uh, which I divided my data into because, you know, it wasn't an endless questionnaire. I could only go for one distinction. Uh, I made the distinction between harassment which can be doing things which are ugly and uncomfortable, but don't involve physical violence. Uh, and uh, assault, which does involve violence and is in person. Um, no one else has collected that data. 
Sure. And making that tight uh, distinction between uh, violent behavior on the sexual uh, victimization front and, uh, you know, bad jokes or, you know, unwanted touching. Well, unwanted touching depends how bad it is, right? But, um, for instance, um, the uh, revelations uh, two weeks ago about the chef in Boston, uh, Barbara, what, what's her last name? I can't remember. Well, while you're well, remembering that, let me just sure. observe yeah. that, uh, yeah. that, that you're. But discrimination is something different. I'm not talking about no. discrimination. No, discrimination is something different. Which we're not talking about it. Okay. He's on third. Yeah. All right. No, the, the, the distinction between um, a, a assault and harassment, basically, uh, what, what I've heard is you making the distinction between the two, but uh, I'm not hearing a definition uh, for sexual harassment. And from what I'm saying, you're you're suggesting the distinction comes from a book that was published in 2020. Well, no, no, no. There is a definition. Thank you. Uh, the assault involves a violent um, um, physical attack, mm -hmm. which could be rape, right? It could be um, uh, unwanted, intense fondling, you know, the Andrew Cuomo kind of stuff. Uh, but it's definitely in person. Harassment, you know, you can do online. Um, Anthony Weiner being a case in point. You know, he wasn't having any contact with these people. He was just sharing pictures of his penis and stuff like that. With people he wasn't working with, so how's that harassment? Well, well also did sexual it with, harassment, I think, can take yeah. true. It, it doesn't yeah. have to be in like work. Uh, anyway, so that is generally, I mean, harassment is much wider and can totally be online as well as in person. Uh, but, you know, I went through assault in my first workplace, which involved being thrown against a wall and having my nipples twisted. That's, you know, I've also experienced harassment, but that was assault. And there's I'm, a difference. Yeah. I'm sorry for what you had to, to deal with. No, no, my but question I, was, but what I, is we, sexual? We, uh, I think we have to, uh, entertain some other questions. Well, sexual harassment, it was um, a simple yes. question. Uh, right. Right. But, yeah, yes. One thing I wanted to ask is, uh, you, know, you look at Bill O'Reilly, Roger Ailes, it seems like a long time ago, and you see Tucker Carlson. And this is my first question. You know, has anything changed you know, in the past eight to 10 years? The second question I want to ask, what are the two or three big Me Too related stories that the financial journalists should be covering now that we're not covering, that we're just completely overlooking? Those are two, two separate questions. Well, I'll be very quick because I'm sure, you know, our actual journalists <laughs> here know much better. I pick out two stories. Uh, one is the Boston chef, who is a woman who uh, has been uh, accused of extraordinary levels of bullying and creating a toxic workplace which involved um, all kinds of you know, touching and inappropriate contact. Uh, the rarity of this case is that she is a woman. And those cases rarely get noticed, but they're there because she was trying to control her empire and keep competitors at bay. It's often about power, and this is where it intersects with feminism because women are not just victims. One of the things that this movement has tried to prove is that women can inherit power and wield it. And with power comes the temptation to use it badly. So well, some women are doing that. And the Abitel Ronell case at NYU was a very good case in point. So we tend to, as women, want to downplay them, but they all happen. So that's one story which I'd like to see more attention to. But the other one is the CBI case because it's about the most powerful uh, business leadership group in Europe. It's all post Me Too and it's a, a, a nest of extraordinary bad behavior. 
uh, which is, it's got a you know 50 year old history. This it's a very venerated group. It sets the standards of the leadership behavior in you know a big world out there. It's gotten very little attention in American press, uh, and I guess you know. Um, Finally, I, I would like more talk about callbacks. I, I love the fact that you had an idea about uh, escrow because it strikes me that that may, might make it much more possible to hold accountable the folks at the center of this drama, which are the top leaders who dictate the culture. Um, I'll start with your first question first, which is what's changed between yeah. Ailes and O'Reilly and, and Carlson? Talk, yeah. um, so I don't mean it Fox, I mean Broadway. You know, oh, well, as a metaphor. Uh, so, specifically with respect to those three, um, we don't know why Carlson was ousted, but I, but I doubt it was for the misogynistic and racist no. emails, because you only have to turn on Fox News at 8 p.m. to see him read it from the prompter, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't think we needed a Dominion $787 million settlement to, to find out what Tucker thought about women or, or people of color. Um, look, the reason Ailes and O'Reilly got ousted, and I suspect the reason Liz Moonves got ousted, and the reason um, any of these men, Matt Lauer, name it, right, um, got ousted is not because people on the board or their superiors were offended by what they did, it's because they started costing the company a lot of money. Um, and in Ailes's case, it was because the Murdoch sons wanted him out. In O'Reilly's case, it was because after $100 million probably combined in, in sexual harassment and sexual assault secret settlements, they just said enough is enough, we can't do this anymore, and advertisers were pulling out, and Tucker, who knows, but I'm sure it's not that. Um, and the same goes for Les Moonves, and the same goes for, for any other prominent man who you see. It's, it becomes a business proposition, a business problem. Um, so what's changed? Um, I, I think the freedom for women to be believed has really changed. I mean, we just weren't believed before. Um, even if you, somebody mentioned, I forget who, the Eugene Carroll case, yes. I don't think it was a um, with Trump, I mean, that would never have been Accepted. People would have said, Are you crazy? You wanted to address your name with a man? What did you expect that happened to you? That would have been the, the logical response five, ten years ago. It's not the logical response today. Um, so I think just that alone is a, is a huge advancement. Um, with respect to what you should be covering, uh, it's, it's what I plugged with you to cover <laughs> from, from day one, which is you're about to have this huge Goldman Sachs settlement. Somebody should take the top two or three women who brought that lawsuit. I, I can't remember the, the name of the most prominent woman. Right, but she's yeah. been at this since 2003, five, five yeah. right? Um, what's happened to her in the last 20 years, right? It's been almost 20 years since this lawsuit's been happening, 18 years. Where has her career gone? since the day that she raised her hand and said, wait a second, I'm the vice president of Goldman Sachs and I've been treated really poorly here. And has she prospered? Did she go to JP Morgan? Did she go to City? Of course not. I don't know where she is, but I'm sure. It's a class level. Right, yeah, right. Because she is at least, you know, we talked about, she's at least in the industry. She's in the industry. She pointed but, out is rare. Right. right. Um, there was a, a, a case of a lawyer at Goldman Sachs, and I hate to pick on Goldman, I don't mean to pick on them, but just an example, um, who stood up for a, um, I think a paralegal who was in her department who had been very brutally harassed by um, a colleague of hers. She was told that her job was being transferred to Dallas. She said, I can't go to Dallas. I have a mother who's very sick. She lives in New York. I have to stay in New York and take care of her. And they said, well, either we move to Dallas or you're out. Um, what happened to her, right? Um, she went to arbitration. I believe she settled her case and, and never heard from again. But the reality is she's not working anymore. I mean, she like does is just there are probably dozens of this stories is, like that. This is a tiny right. illustration. I mean, that's why I keep saying I don't need to pick on Goldman because... But there are 1,400 women from Goldman. There are, right, correct. Right. But, but, but she makes the women throughout Goldman, which to me is fascinating. Right. It's just a story more as much as the suit itself. Yes. Right, yes. Yeah, and so I think that's that's what I would love for you all to focus on because I think so. It's when you don't focus on that, it makes it that much harder, not just you, but when reporters don't focus on that, it makes it so much harder for women to come forward because they say, I came forward, I gave these guys a great explosive story, they all went away, right. and I'm screwed. I mean, that's it, like I, I'm unemployed, I don't know what to do with my life. Um, and and more, most importantly, my predator and the people who enabled him are not being held accountable. Mm -hmm. 
because once the camera lights are off and once the reporters put down their pencils, that's really when the bad stuff begins. And that's what I really just strongly beg of you to, to focus on. Don't put down your pencils. Don't turn off the cameras. Follow these stories to see what happens when people think you're not paying attention anymore. Let's take one more question. Oh, can I? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Pierre. I I, just I quickly, I wanted to say, first to your question, um, you know, to your first question, uh, we also spoke to Tarana Burke um, back in October when we did this five year anniversary. She's the person who originally coined Me Too. Yeah. And yeah. she pointed out, um, you know, before before it went viral, she had to beg people to put it on the agenda. And at least she doesn't have to beg people to take it seriously anymore. We're having this panel tonight, so thank you. And I will say the, um, you know, the story I want, I. I I think it's great that we have seen Me Too and reporting on these problems continue to have consequences. I would really love to see some holding holding industries and companies account outside primarily media and entertainment, um, outside the the big names like Goldman of the world. I mean, we, we no, I am not diminishing anything that anyone went through at Goldman, at Fox, at NBC Universal, but those are companies where um, it's you know it's been easier to just get your get your story in the press, and I so I guess I would love to see more reporting on you know what happens to women and people um, who don't have as easy access to the media. I guess I'm asking for more investigative reporting, which I. That was difficult sometimes. Maybe in small workplaces where there's really no accountability. Yes. Uh, yeah, John Jacobs has a hand up. Yes. Uh, this, any of the panelists is welcome to, to tackle this one, although it was Sylvia that first mentioned Google. Um, I have noticed over the years that the guy I think of as the Google bro, this was, I believe, a very junior level engineer only a few years in the business published a long manifesto that, in my impression, is it just all boils down to one sentence. There's a lot of women working in this company and they're not smart enough to be working alongside of me. I think that's the whole thrust of the Google manifesto. Um, and of course he was fired, but my impression is there was a lot of blowback and pushback on that, and, and maybe there still is, like I read it and Twitter and the comment threads of mainstream media outlets where, you know, readers anonymously or not, you know, post their thoughts. I, there seems to be a constituency out there that, you know, is, is carrying water for this guy. And I'm, I'm wondering if you've seen anything like that. And if so, is it what's, what implications are there? And if especially like how is there has there been any kind of feeling or constituency like that within Google leadership uh, since then? Well, I have two small um, insights. I was involved in the uh, Uber story uh, with the Kalani, you know, uh, uh, Travis Kalani. Yes, Travis. You know, he was thrown out, and Ariana was you know, part of that whole thing. Um, her commentary about brilliant jerks, um, I think is a thread here because at Uber, which was very proud of its brutal toxic culture and one of its 10 values was to tread on people. This was an official piece of their credo, wow. right? Well, we've seen that, you know, happen around the world, and there was tremendous sympathy for Kalanick when he was shut down. Uh, brilliant jerks, you know, whether they be Tucker Carlson or, you know, Travis Kalanick, uh, if they make enough money for uh, their company, uh, they do become heroes. Um, maybe it's just... <laughs> capitalism, but you know, I, I do feel, but Mao had it going on too. <laughs> um, yes, uh, you know, did. history does not tell us that progressive causes are cumulative. 
So if we can see some small triumphs, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I love the way you laid some of them out. One of my daughters is in politics, and I tell you, politics <laughs> at the state level is going south because we have um, Republican values dominant in terms of relationships between the sexes. Well, and it's women that put Trump in office and screwed us all. White women. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, anyway, I, I don't want to be some kind of, you know, um, mean spirit here, but I, I think that <laughs> in order to get the energy to push the back forward, um, it's extremely important for us to collectively follow the story, see where it ends up, and lift up the things that have changed. Excellent. Yes. Uh, Julie and uh, Maria, if you have any closing comments, go ahead. I think they will be. I, I would just say, yes, I, I think there's, you know, to go back to Ellen Powell's comment, I think there's definitely a libertarianism and contrarianism, contrarianism that continues in tech to this day and a sort of, you know, we're going to speak truth to power even if it's a controversial truth. Um, thinking of, you know, companies like Coinbase, for example, um, or, you know, even, again, I'm, I'm maybe conflating, but even like Andreessen Horowitz backing the WeWork founder after he like, failed spectacularly. I think there's a real, we're, we're the smartest guys in the world, and I, I use guys particularly, and we're, you know, we're not going to let some petty media chatter get in the way of our investment thesis and our recognizing genius. Brilliant chips. Brilliant chips. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's right, but I think it, in addition to all of that, where you have a, a massive um, dilemma, and I think you mentioned Donald Trump, is we become really anesthetized to outrageous behavior yes. um, in the last like, six or seven years. And there is this counter push to say, well, if you, if you raise your hand and say this is unacceptable, these are being, this is woke or, or cancel culture, or all these other phrases that are being thrown out, let's, let's harken back to a decade ago where some of the stuff that you hear some of these brilliant jerks saying out loud would have cost them their lives. I mean, they would have cost them their livelihoods um, if they had said this, but we've become very anesthetized. And so I think for all of us, it's our responsibility to continue to not accept this kind of behavior as that's just the way it is, um, to, to continue to be shocked at bad behavior to say, well, I don't care that it's locker room talk. It's not acceptable to, to speak that way. Um, and this whole mentality that, that if you push back on it, you're woke or you're, or you're part of the cancel movement or whatever the cancel culture. Um, it's just basic fundamental behavior. And to your question about what constitutes sexual harassment, um, look, there, there's a there's a huge gamut of it. Somebody saying to you, "I'm going to give you a promotion if you sleep with me." That's sexual harassment, right? Um, and in terms of what's acceptable or not acceptable, that's just not acceptable. That's not locker room talk. That's not somebody saying to you, "You're really hot," and I wish you know I could take you home tonight, even though you work for me. And by the way, if you do it, maybe I'll give you a raise next quarter. That's not acceptable. And it has become something that I think tech guys pride themselves on. You have Elon Musk who's basically priding himself on this kind of rhetoric. Um, you have people like Donald Trump, and I don't mean to be partisan, but guys like him who are priding themselves on this kind of um, rhetoric. Tucker in, in, in what you saw on air. Um, you have it in media, you have it in politics. I'm sorry your daughter works state government. I've been there, it's really horrible. Uh, probably more toxic than any of the industries we talked about. <laughs> but, uh, but the reality is, it is not acceptable. And you know it, much like that adage about porn, you know it when you see it, you know it when you see it. And I think there's not one woman here who wouldn't know what sexual harassment was when she saw it. Um, and I think for the guys out here, and the people that you're covering, just treat people with respect, and then you don't have to worry about it. That's it.